Hi and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all sitting comfortably with a nice cup of tea because today I'm going to be reading you an extract from this book, Rowan, which is the second in the Artisan Sorcery series. So I hope you enjoy it. Chapter one. Do you want me to open it for you? Rowan stared at the manila envelope in his hand the pulse in his throat was jumping. No, I'm okay. He took a deep breath, then thrust a finger under the flap and tore the envelope open. He ignored the cover letter. All he wanted was his A-level results. Lydia held her breath. She sat bolt upright in the armchair. She reached for her cup of tea, then changed her mind, staring at her nephew's pale and serious face. I only got grade C in maths. Lydia waited in silence, immobile. Sunlight from the window glinted on her shoulder-length silver hair. But I got an A in English, B in history and A in philosophy. You're going to university! Lydia was on her feet and jumping around the living room, laughing and shrieking with delight. You're going to university! I am so pleased for you! Wonderful, wonderful news! Mom? Hi, it's me. Rowan, I was just thinking of you. I could do with some help painting the shed. He gripped the telephone a little tighter. I just got my exam results. Don't be too disappointed, will you? I bought the paint already. It's a nice green colour. The trellis could do with smartening up too. It wouldn't take long, a couple of afternoons maybe. I suppose you'll be looking for a job now. That won't be easy. You're not qualified to do anything. Your sister Alicia studied law, but that takes a lot of hard work and dedication. And you're really not career minded, are you? I start university in the autumn. He stared fixedly at the sunny front garden beyond the drawing room window. Oh, well, that's good then, I suppose. But how are you going to afford it? I've got no money. And if you fail your studies, you'll still have to pay back any bank loans, you know. And without a job, how are you going to do that with no qualifications? I've been awarded a bursary and I have a part-time job. You know this already. He felt his shoulder muscles tighten as he held the phone. Don't be sharp, Rowan adds head. Anyway... That's not much of a job, is it, taking telephone messages? There won't be much money in that, I don't suppose. Do you get a proper wage, or is it cash in hand? Her abrasive manner was more needling than usual, even for her. My salary is paid directly into my bank account, Mother, and an art gallery assistant does rather more than answer phones. He ran a hand through his sandy auburn hair and tried to keep impatience from his voice. He could picture his mother standing in her hall, adjusting her beloved porcelain ladies as she gripped the telephone, running a critical finger over cold crinoline skirts to check for dust. Well, you know what you're doing, I'm sure, she said without conviction. Working around all those paintings probably suits you. You like having nice things to look at, I suppose. Are you going to study childcare or hairdressing like I advised? I'll be taking English and philosophy, as I've told you several times. As he struggled to keep his temper, his gaze fixed on a colourful jumble, jumble of applique cushions lining the old brown leather sofa. What kind of a job will that get you? You could teach English in schools, I suppose, but a lot of people don't like teaching anymore. Children are so unruly now you can't wallop them. It will be very stressful for you. But philosophy? Why don't you learn something practical that you can make a career from? I suppose it's that sister of mine filling your head with all sorts of airy notions. I have every intention of having a career, Rowan said, watching a black-headed gull winging its way towards the beach. He wished he was out there too, beneath the open skies. A career as what? shrilled Jacqueline over the phone. Still, I don't suppose you can help it, considering. But it's out of my hands now, isn't it? 
Perhaps if your father hadn't gone off with that ghastly woman, things might have been different. But he made his choices and so have you. And I'm left to cope with things all by myself. When will you come to paint my shed? What choices do you imagine I've made? He ground his teeth and stared at the ceiling, deliberately ignoring her last question. He hated the sound of her voice in his ear. Well, you wouldn't go to the doctor, would you? You could have tried. Mum, I am not ill. That's a matter of opinion. There's no need to get angry with me. I've always done my best for you. Mum, you threw me out. I was 17. I was living on the streets. If you say so, I just wanted to encourage you to seek proper medical help, that's all. Anyway, you're okay, aren't you? No harm done. Rowan was shaking with rage. Perspiration soaked his back, making the thin fabric of his t-shirt stick to him. There was so much that he wanted to say to make her understand, but he knew she would not listen. Bye, Mum. What about my shed? Rowan hung up. Hi, Josie. How did you get on at the hospital? Rowan had waited a full ten minutes before making this next phone call. Oh, Rowan, you should have seen the prints out of the scan. You can see these tiny fingers and the baby's face and his little button nose. I was so happy, I was crying. I showed them to your dad when he got home from work that night. He went all quiet and misty-eyed. That's great news, Josie. Actually, I can hardly hear you over the phone for your radio. OK, hang on while I turn it down. I was just doing the vacuuming and Madonna came on, so I turned it up. There, can you hear me better now? Yeah, thanks. Rowan gazed out of the drawing room window and into the front garden where Lydia was deadheading yellow roses with an ancient pair of secateurs and throwing the trimmings into a grey bucket by her feet. It was so like her to give him privacy while he made his dutiful phone calls. <clears throat> Do you want to speak to your dad? He's still at the bank. Honestly, he's a workaholic. Josie giggled, her chunky plastic bracelets knocking loudly against the telephone. The fat wad of gum squelched as she chewed. Rowan suppressed irritation. May I leave a message? Of course you can, ducky. Rowan cringed at the term. Would you let my father know I was accepted by the University of Liverpool this afternoon? Oh great, you got in. He'll be so pleased. Yeah, I'll tell him. I don't know what time he'll be home. He's already late and his dinner's in the oven. But of course I'll tell him. And congratulations from me and the bump too. Rowan laughed slightly. Thanks, Josie. I've got to go now. OK, take care of yourself, kiddo. Oceanic breezes tugged at Rowan's sandy auburn hair. Sunlight had bleached the crown blonde. He leaned back on his sharp elbows, the rough grass spiking through his thin white t-shirt. Darting silver white light stung his green eyes as he gazed at the grey water sucking softly at damp ridge sand beyond the rock pools. Black-headed gulls screeched high above their wings pounding through the arching azure sky. A group of hikers in brightly coloured waterproofs snaked their way from Hilbury Island over the red bunter sandstone rocks around Middle Eye where Rowan sat. He checked his watch. He had 30 minutes before he absolutely had to leave or else be cut off by the incoming tide for eight hours or thereabouts. His backpack did not contain enough food or mineral water for that. Yet he did not relish the prospect of walking back to Little Eye, then the mainland, alongside other people. You're quite the budding misanthropist, his father had said at one of their monthly meetings in a restaurant. I don't hate people. Rowan had sipped slowly from his wine glass. They just don't interest me much. Francis Adshead had then launched into one of his self-congratulatory speeches about how networking had proved invaluable in developing his banking career and how those in middle management absolutely had to be team players and be amiable without too much familiarity. They were competitors, all looking for the edge which would bring them a bigger slice of that same pie 
which Rowan should be aspiring to. Rowan had heard similar lectures many times before, and he didn't wish to think about them again now, as he rose to his feet on Middle Eye and walked across this small island's grassy summit and descended the steep stone steps carved into the cliff face. He could faintly hear the hiker's voices carried on the wind and resented even this intrusion. Rowan began the long walk across flat golden sand towards the small grass top rock known as Little Eye. He was in awe of the huge sky where white clouds sailed like luminous ships to unknown destinations. He felt less alone out here than he did in a crowded nightclub. He felt more alive. The wind was never still here. Its movement carried bird cries and the sound of his own feet crunching on the sand. The low rumble of the ocean and the sharp tang of briny seaweed, and sometimes the plaintive chorus of the seal herd, which lounged on distant West Hoyle sandbank. The quality of light changed from moment to moment, highlighting first one nuance, then another. Rowan's hand caressed a camera bag worn around his slender waist like a holster. A career as a photographer had definite appeal. His parents said that he had no ambition. This was not true. Rowan had many diverse interests. In fact, he felt bewildered by the prospect of having to choose just one speciality when so many subjects held appeal. Yet, despite having secured a placement at university, he had not settled on a definite career plan. Business studies, his father had been adamant, pointing his fork like a spear. You can follow your interests as a hobby. Be practical. If you want a decent lifestyle and a good home, you need money. And to earn worthwhile money, you need a solid job. And for that, you need business skills. Forget about philosophy and studying medieval poets. Look at how well I've done. Rowan thought that his father's life revolved around a moderately successful but dull career that left little time for anything else even for his new wife Josie. And for his first wife, Jacqueline, Rowan's mother, Francis Adshead had no time at all. Even Rowan was methodically logged into Francis's diary once each month as 7pm sun, along with a choice of restaurant. Francis didn't even choose a restaurant or book the table. His secretary took care of that. Rowan scowled as he strode across the sands. He had walked out to the islands to get away from such thoughts, but he had already learned that his inner life was inescapable, no matter how far he might travel. He focused his mind on the present moment, on the sound of hard, damp sand beneath his marching boots, on the pull of the muscles in his legs, and on the sharp, briny air. Flat red rocks at the base of Little Eye were around him now. He slowed his pace as the ground rose up the sloping sides of the island, which was barely more than a hillock above sea level. He clambered onto its summit where rugged, wind-scorched grass offered a spartan home to stoic crickets. Looking back towards Middle Eye, he could see that the hikers were walking diagonally across the sands towards the mainland, rather than taking the safe route which he was using. If they wanted to risk getting stuck in estuary mud, that was their lookout. The safe route was clearly posted beside the Tides timetable on the public information board by West Kirby Beach Ramp. He had no pity for people who willingly ignored the warnings and died as a consequence. The Irish Sea has surrounded Hilbury Island now, and was flooding long channels across the sand, parallel to the mainland. The hikers were wading through one of these, which looked about knee-deep already. Rowan smirked at their predicament. Dry sands back to West Kirby still lay in front of him, though he began walking at a lively pace. The safe route wouldn't remain dry for much longer. The bay was broad and flat, and the tide came in with deceptive speed. The breeze had grown sharper. Rowan unhooked his backpack and pulled out a jumper and an apple. It was an old orange jumper with a hole in one elbow and the hem had lost its shape long ago. 
but it was a favourite. It felt good to wear, warm and familiar and cosy. Aunt Lydia had wanted to fling it in the dustbin, but he wouldn't hear of it, so she had relented with one of her little smiles. Now he trudged over the whistling sands, crunching on the apple, and watched red and white sails glide across the marina. His legs ached from the long walk, but he didn't care. He loved being out here. He found a meditative peace on Middle Eye. How ironic, he thought, that the place he'd taken to meditating at was named M Middle Eye. Rowan kept walking towards a concrete ramp on West Kirby Beach. The car park beside the marina was half empty as usual, but the ice cream vendor in his small wooden shack was doing a modest trade in hot tea. Fine, dry sand around the concrete ramp slowed his pace, but soon Rowan stepped onto the paved promenade beyond. He slid his backpack to the floor beside an empty bench and pulled out a bottle of mineral water and his notebook. He never went anywhere without a notebook. Or his faux tortoiseshell ink pen. He began to write, not sentences exactly, but impressions of sand and open spaces, huge skies, small islands and freedom. He was being watched. Rowan became aware of this purely by instinct. He could feel the weight of a curious gaze resting on his bowed, tousled head. He raised his wintergreen eyes. Leaning casually against the robust iron railings which edged West Kirby Promenade was a slim figure clad in black biker's leathers. He looked to be in his mid-twenties. A glossy black helmet was hooked in one hand and the jacket hung open to reveal a semi-transparent black t-shirt. He was sipping a polystyrene cup of steaming tea. Forgive me for staring, he said with a disarming smile. I didn't mean to be rude or threatening. Rowan watched him carefully, waiting for any sudden moves. He closed his notebook and slipped the cap onto his pen. You look like a poet writing there. I am a poet, actually. The broad smile flashed again. Really? Wonderful. I am an avid reader of all forms of literature. Permit me to introduce myself. From an inside jacket pocket, he withdrew a small ivory-coloured card. He moved forwards to hand this to Rowan, then politely stepped back to the railing, where he assumed the same relaxed pose as before. Rowan read the card, surprised by this unexpected gesture. The card was plain yet elegant. The first line of his script read, Aidan Dane. The second line offered an email address. There was nothing more on the card. No address, no phone number, no logo. Rowan lightly held the card, unsure how to react. I don't have something like this to swap with you. Aidan shrugged and smiled. Never mind. It's a beautiful day. I came out for a ride. That's mine parked there. Aidan waved the helmet towards an old Triumph motorbike. With the other long, thin hand, he raised the polystyrene cup to sip the tea. So you're a poet? Have you had anything published? Rowan unzipped his backpack and slipped his notebook and pen inside and fastened it again. A few things in small magazines. Excellent! Congratulations! I've heard it's very difficult to break into publication. Perseverance seems to be the key and also the continual perfecting of your craft. I know many creative people. Rowan leaned back on the bench, cautious but intrigued. Aidan was good-looking, certainly, with sharp, prominent cheekbones set in an angular, oblong face. His thick chestnut hair was cut short around his neck and ears, but left a little longer on the top, so that it hung over his almond-shaped dark blue eyes. Rowan said, so you were creative yourself? I used to be. Aidan sighed and looked at the floor momentarily, before covering the reaction with a cynical half-smile. But now I am a businessman. Now it is time for me to earn money and become responsible. Rowan laughed quietly. You hate it that much? Aidan's level gaze met Rowan's and he flashed a brilliant smile. Absolutely, it's boring, but it's a means to an end. I am a floor manager and soon I will become a branch manager and then 
Ah, oh, you know how it goes. I will have my own business within the next five years. You sound very sure of yourself. Rowan's gaze slipped beyond aid into the beach, where an elderly man was playing ball with his spaniel. Aidan nodded and sipped his tea. Yes, perhaps, but who knows how things might turn out. He smiled pleasantly to clothe his naked ambition. What of you? What do you do? University. Well, soon, anyway. Rowan's attention was drawn by the piercing wail of a child whose ice cream had dropped on the floor. Wonderful. I envy the opportunity. Really, I do. I had hoped to study a number of things, but... Aidan shrugged again and said, Anyway, I work now, but I read all the time. A person should strive to feed their mind always. It is the most precious possession, above even gold. Rowan rested one arm on the back of the bench and smiled. To subtly challenge his stranger's bold self-assurance, he asked, Who were your favourite authors? I don't limit myself to favourites. I read everything. A book a week, sometimes two. Anything that is new and has earned acclaimed. And the classics, of course. Magazines, too, for the culture of the moment. And films, plays. Everything. Aidan flashed another of his stunning smiles. His teeth were perfect. Rowan realised he was still holding Aidan's card. He slipped it into a pocket on his backpack. Aidan watched him, smiling faintly, then looked away along the length of the beach. The tide is almost in now. The beach is almost gone. Yeah, and I was on the islands not long ago. Really? I've never been there. I should go just for the experience. I don't often drive out here. Do you live in West Kirby? Aidan took another sip of his tea. Rowan shook his head. No, Hoy Lake with my aunt. It's the next village along the coast. But when you start university, you'll be in student hall somewhere. No, I'm staying with my aunt. She's been... I owe her a lot. Aidan nodded. So you'll be attending one of Liverpool's universities. I work in the city and live in the suburbs. I've been here for two years now. I like Liverpool. There's so much opportunity. I might stay here forever, but who knows? I want to travel too. There's so much to see in this world, and I've hardly been anywhere. I've been to Canada and Turkey and to Germany. I have an aunt there. And Italy is wonderful, of course. But really, I've seen so little. Rowan shook his head to clear his mind. He felt dazzled by Aidan. He glowed with vitality. Rowan felt dull by comparison. He was suddenly aware of the large hole in the elbow of his baggy orange jumper, which had never troubled him before. To hide his self-consciousness, he watched a few people strolling along the promenade and said, I've not been anywhere, really. Aidan gazed at him intently. Maybe, but you've seen something of life, I think. Yeah, too much. Never too much. Aidan drained the last of his tea. The darkest shadows veil the greatest gifts. I've enjoyed talking with you. It isn't often that I meet someone who genuinely interests me. Most are, well, you know... Mundane, average, to most average is a virtue, but not to me, or to you, I think. Rowan blushed and looked away again, then he steadied his breath and gazed back at this unusual man. Those dark blue eyes were intoxicating, those cheekbones were to die for. Aidan slowly stepped away from the railing, he moved with the gliding grace of a predatory cat. I have to go now, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Rowan watched him walking towards a Triumph motorbike. He wanted to ask something, but wasn't sure how to phrase it. Email me, Aidan pulled on the helmet and swung aside his bike. Rowan relaxed and nodded. I will. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to that, which is the start of Rowan, with the second novel in the Artisan Sorcerer series. You can read the books in any order you wish to, though technically it starts with Bethany Rose, then Rowan, then Tamsin, then Fabian, and we're currently writing the fifth one. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know what you think. Leave me a comment below. Thanks for listening, and have a look at the little subscribe button, which is actually in that corner. Yeah, that corner. I always get the corners mixed up. <laughs> and I'll see you soon. Okay, bye.